Okay, uh, I'm uh, happy to talk uh, today about, on behalf of the CMS experiment, about the, the status. This uh, status report is essentially covering what has not been covered in the, in the previous LHCC report in March. Let me start by a brief reminder. This was a very, very exciting period over the last two years. With, in 2010, uh, we collected the, the first 35 inverse pico barn uh, of PP data and the first few micro barn, uh, micro barn, inverse micro barn of, of lead data. This led uh, actually in particular to this uh, sort of rediscovery of the standard model, scanning through all the resonances up to the Z, and now we're moving in this, this uh, let's say, unknown territory here. And these are things that were published already with 40 inverse pico barn. In 2011, this was a major, major increase of luminosity, 230 or so, moving up to five inverse vector barn with PP, moving to 150 inverse pico barn for P, uh, lead collisions. All the results I show today, essentially all of the results I show today will be with the full luminosity, both in PP and in lead lead, which actually is quite an achievement given that we are not so far beyond, behind the end of this run. And now we're in between Morillon and Egypt, so many of the results, including the X results, of course, are lying in front of us. So as a reminder of what we did with this 2011 data, even part of it was the uh, precision measurements on Z, WZ boson production, di boson production, up to the ZZ, and the next layer here should be the, should be the, the X. We also measured, of course, W plus jets, one, two, three, four, Z plus jets, one, two, three, four. These are very important background for eggs and new physics searches. So 2012, well, now we reached the stars. We have an efficiency of data collection of 92%. This was the data actually collected last Sunday. It's moving so fast that the numbers have to be incre incremented significantly every day. We got this posting on the Hyper News a few days ago by our crew at the P5, uh, announcing that we have crossed the five inverse femto barn uh, uh, data taking. It's very, very nice to see that the people working hard in the pit are very excited in collecting the maximal amount of good data for CMS, even after a few years. So CMS operation status, sorry. So this is the various detectors of the experiments. All of the detectors are, fu are functioning to very, very high efficiency. This picture is a bit old. The lu integrated luminosity uh, per day has reached uh, our coming close to 200 inverse pico barn per day. We had there a little record on that particular day where we collected in 24 hours 240 inverse pico barn. So that was a 97% efficiency. And thus, again, congratulations to the hard work done at, at the P5 for the experiment. So going from 2011 to 2012, we go from 7 to 8 TeV. The main motivation here is increase the production cross sections for new physics at the, at the TeV scale. You gain about 20% for the Higgs. We have changed the beta star from one meter to 0.6 meter. This increase the uh, instantaneous luminosity. It also increases pileup. We've seen a lot in the previous talk on this. We work with 50 nanosecond bunch spacing. And we have a goal of about 700, uh, 7, uh, 10 to the 33 uh, uh, in terms of luminosity. And as you can see in the, in the as, you will, as you have mentioned in, in the previous slide, this, this, uh, this goal is uh, basically almost achieved. So what we have to do with this high luminosity and high instantaneous luminosity is learn how to live with, uh, with pileup. So first data taking rates, we have deployed a new software. That software has allowed us to gain about a factor 2.5 in speed. So we're now below 20 seconds per event. We have about a reduction of 33% memory that allowed us to avoid any limitation in data taking from data taking from the Comprico at tier zero. Mo much more was uh, discussed on this kind of issue in the previous LHCC. In terms of rate and CPU time on the LHCT farm, we're right on target with an average data taking rate of 350 hertz. And we, are, we were basically approaching some kind of 
close to our limit in terms of event uh, processing, 100 milliseconds per event, but now we have upgraded the CPU farm by 50% in May. We're collecting, in addition, since uh, uh, two, three weeks, about 200, 310 actually is the average additional part data that is being collected. So as I mentioned, well, we are very coming very close to the goal of 7, 10 to the 10 to the 3. We have deployed various menus from 5, 10 to the 33 to 7 up to now. And these are the trigger menu. Here I just want to single out the threshold that we use, and in particular the threshold that we use for the X gamma gamma. This is 36 and 22 GeV. And the thresholds we use for the four lepton. We have a double muon trigger, a double electron trigger. We also park some, da some additional data there. And we have a combined trigger, muon electron. And this combined trigger is quite impressive. It allows us to go and get these very low uh, uh, Z, Z star resonance, where basically both Z are off shell. And then you get very low PT leptons. And it allows us to recuperate a few more percent of the efficiency loss from this combined cross trigger. Living with pileup, we don't have that many approved results yet on the performances, but let me make a quick summary of where we stand. The mean pileup measured is about 13 now. It's about 50% raise compared to 2011B. It's a bit larger in reality because of small efficiencies, inefficiencies. But meanwhile, we continue deployment of pileup mitigation techniques for physics analysis and evolve to less sensitive observable. Just a few uh, examples. We have event-by-event -event corrections. They are based on mean energy densities. These are the concept of these uh, fast jets. And uh, they uh, essentially uh, rely on these techniques to measure on event-by-event -event the uh, uh, mean energy density in the event. And we also complement that for, with a local track matching at the primary vertex in specific cases. We rely now more and more and more on particle flow reconstruction techniques. This is now true for jets, for lepton isolation, etc. And we're putting more, and these techniques, they actually put more emphasis on the good tracks, which are not affected by the pileup. We have also massive development of MVA techniques. These are validated on standard model candle. They are just on pileup reweighting, uh, Monte Carlo for photons and lepton ID, etc. So these will be used now for the summer results on all the X channels. For instance, we are now uh, using boosted decision tree techniques for the photon ID and for the electron ID in the X analysis. And after all the hard work, well, the mean pileup effects on the physics that relies on isolated leptons or photons or IPT jets is well under control. They are really small effect uh, on the pileup on the pileup corrected observable or final sensitivity. So let now me. me let me now move to physics. We have published up to now about 130 physics papers, about twice as much uh, uh, different analysis, uh, uh, summaries that uh, did not go to the publication. There is another 100 more or so publication on the way with 2011 data. This was the big outflow of results on the Higgs in Morion 2012. This is this talk. I will cover only these, some of these very last results here. Not solely, but mostly. Okay. So, let me move now to some of the recent physics highlights. First, we have discovered a new particle. Well, it's not yet the X, but it's a new particle. This is in the, in the, in the family of the, you know, in the well-established quark model. Uh, and the corresponding spectroscopy of, uh, of uh, baryons. There are several predicted uh, baryons that contain one strange and one beauty quark, and they can be either neutral, that is, if they have S U S B or U as an additional quark, or charge as a DSB uh, valence quark, and the state they further differ by the total angular momentum and, uh, and the parity. So, this is what we have observed. This particle here is uh, the, the measurement is shown here. This is actually uh, measured through a long decay chain, and we measure the mass difference between this and the decay product, and we subtract the mass of these ob known objects, and then we end up with this mass of this new state. This is believed to be a GP3, uh, uh, how do you say, 3.5 plus, 
that is a companion of the Xi B uh, variant. So this is a very nice and neat uh, small observation as an appetizer. We have released now from the 2011 data, full data set, a measurement which I find very, very impressive. This is fully deconvoluted measurement compared to next to next to leading order uh, of the Drelian in di-electron and di-muons. And you see the uh, uh, quite incredible precision of the measurement we reached now. I just want to remind on this that we have pre uh, uh, published last year a measurement of uh, the uh, effective uh, wheat mixing angle uh, uh, from the Radian measurement, and this is, this is from a previous paper, just to illustrate the, um, the, the kind of uh, nice precision that we now reach in this, in this sector. One reminder here on the jet mass, jet uh, invariant mass in W plus jet events. As you know, this is an important background for X and BSM. In, uh, at the LHC, we easily extend the phase space uh, beyond the Tevatron when we look for R the recoil against the W or the Z boson. And uh, the, so it's a very interesting thing to look at. Moreover, there was an excess observed in CDF not confirmed by D0. This is the excess that was observed. This is the measurement that is done on the invariant mass of the jet in, the, in CMS. This is what you would observe if this was true at that uh, uh, rate here. And we find no evidence for a resonance enhancement around an invariant mass of 150 in this channel. Let me skip maybe top mass measurement. I just wanted here to, uh, to give you the latest uh, mass uh, value here measurement, which are mostly, I mean, the, the, ma the main channel there is lepton plus jet. Uh, and uh, uh, just a, a reminder of the cost measurement that we get from the cost section with these value this as uh, usual tend to be slightly low, but the, uh, but the error is very large, so these are compatible with an error. What I wanted to show is this one, which is nice. This is a recent result on the test of CPT invariance in the top sector. So what we measure is actually the mass of the top uh, and the difference between the mass of the top and the anti-top, and we essentially use events where we have one lepton that is balanced with, with the three jets from the other uh, uh, top quark, and we, of course, work out the full combinatorial, and we use a kinematical fit, and actually the technique to reconstruct the top mass is exactly the same as the one we used to derive the top mass in the previous slide. What we have obtained there is a different in mass that is shown here, of compatible with zero. Actually, in this measurement, most of the systematics cancel out, and this is sort of the world's the world best so far, consistent with some model, and consistent with uh, CP invariance. So I think this is a very, very nice measurement comparing L plus and then minus. Well, L plus and L minus is the one which allow you to tag the top or the anti-top on the other side. There was a, a slide in the previous talk on this, so let me also show some result on uh, top charge asymmetry measurement. You uh, all know that uh, some anomalous charge asymmetry was observed at the Tevatron. These are the papers. At the LHC, we have a different situation. We produce the top mostly through the gluon. And actually, we still can uh, define an asymmetry, but that asymmetry is partly diluted. Now, this is what you see at the, at the Tevatron. This is what you see at the LHC. We have a new CMS measurement that asymmetry is compatible with zero. The, well, essentially compatible with the standard model, with an error, I should say, uh, not zero. And uh, we find, actually, we have looked a bit uh, further and looked in the uh, dependence on the phase space, as shown here as function of rapidity, PT, and, uh, and the mass of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, pair. And uh, here we see, essentially, uh, something which is compatible with expectation. So no uh, anomalous dependence on the phase space. The top quark decay, well, this is X sector, but it's also anomalous top quark decay. We have looked in actually all uh, various different diagrams here where the tau decays in leptons or adron or the W decays in leptons or adrons. Here I show the diagram for the full adronic decay. Uh, here the top goes into uh, charge X and a B. The uh, charge X go 100% in a tau and a neutrino. This is the uh, transverse mass uh, measured compared to... Uh, to uh, 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 the, the expectation from the background and superposed with uh, 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 a signal from a charge X at 120 GeV. This is converted in the limit, the absence of a signal is converted in the limit on the branching ratio of the top quark in H plus B. And that number is very impressive. If you remember at the Tevatron, this is of order 20% or so. 
So at these masses here, we gain about a factor 10 in sensitivity compared to previous limits at the Tevatron on the branching of the top. So we're at the, coming close to the percent level in terms of constraining the top decays or anomalous top decay. This is very nice, I think. Moving to the IGs. These are the papers that we've published, most of them in time for Morion. Some came slightly after Morion. I just showed you this charge X. Then we have a number of physics analysis summary. We have many physics analysis summaries on top of the physics publication in CMS. One of them is very interesting. Then all of these are very interesting. One of them is particularly interesting. This is H2 gamma in a full MVA multivariate analysis that was published also at the end of March. Okay, let me skip this. This is just a collection of channels. This is for the slide. You can look at that afterwards. Just a summary where we stand. Well, this was the exclusion limit combined results from the full luminosity 2011 before and after. And after in CMS, we are left with a window between 114.4, that's left, and 127 at 95% confidence level. This is the allowed mass range for standard model X boson that would couple in a standard manner both to the boson and with the Yukawa coupling we expect on the fermions. Just as a reminder, this is what we add. This is 2011. Uh, in the low mass range, you're counting just a very few. In that actually small range, sorry, do I have this superposition here? No, I don't. Or at least it's, yeah, it's on the screen, but it's not seen. Actually, there is a little light here, and you find these sort of five events in the range between 114 and 127. Actually, the yield in this full range here is compatible with expectation, slightly higher than, uh, expe uh, than expectation. So, just as a reminder, what kind of precision we get on these kinds of events, just, uh, okay, this is just the intrinsic width of the X. We actually, in the low mass range, dominated by experimental resolution. This is the event by event error on their four lepton masses. And this dotted line here is the 1% curve. And you see that when you go to low, low masses, in this very low mass range, most of our events are measured with a 4%, uh, with a 1%, sorry, precision. Actually, we get a better precision on the 4 mu and slightly worse on average on the 4 electrons. But every now and then, we might be lucky and get a very, very good 4 electron measurement. I just want here to show again the photon. Uh, and there, again, the overlay is too shadow, too small, so you don't really see. I was trying to hide the, uh, the sort of disallowed region and focus on this area around 1 to 5. Anyway, just show you one event here. This is H to gamma gamma event in the digest tag channel. So we have an analysis which is, uh, which is basically uh, inclusive, and we also have a specific VBF tag channel because a fraction of the, pro uh, of the cross section, 10% or so, comes from VBF vector boson fusion production. So we have a forward backward jet tag. And this is a very, very spectacular candidate where you see a pair of photons, a forward and a backward, or a backward and a forward, as you wish, uh, jets. So where did we uh, stand actually with this? Remember, this was the, the anatomy of this, uh, of this situation in the low mass range with the fluctuation here compatible with expectation from standard model, not very significant. And uh, uh, actually, uh, with a significance in the strictest restricted range, let's say 110, 145, to be conservative, of about 2.1 sigma, compatible with expectation. And this particular fluctuation was mostly gamma gamma, and a little little fluctuation here, driven mostly by four lepton. When we did the MVA analysis of the gamma gamma, what we have is a little dip that builds up around 120. That dip suppresses a little bit the effect of the four lepton. So this four lepton is left alone. The mean is going down here. And we still have this fluctuation here, compatible with expectation. And again, about a 2.1 sigma in the same mass range. So this is the situation. OK, where do we go from there? Well, this is the, uh, the actually uh, uh, a reminder of the CMS input for Chamonix. These are plots for 7 TeV. These are plots for 8 TeV. 10 from to barn, 10 from to barn. Pick the one you want. Well, it's sitting here in this little, little round thing. I think if you pick the top on, 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 the, on the evil, on the indigo, you'll see better this round. We're sitting there. So somehow we're there. And we're there, well, 
this is so very, at least on average, should give us something very, very close to a five sigma. Just to remind you again, on the four left one, if you pick a one to five GeV, you expect, well, three to four event. Final number you'll see in the publication from the summer, it depends on the hard work on efficiency and kinematics and everything we use in this analysis. Something like three to four event. In about five, fig, five femtobarn for the eggs. In the four lepton, with a single two background of about two in the peak. Of course, the analysis is done with full shape, including kinematic for production decay angles, everything, but that's about it. That means you require about 20 femtobarn for five sigma standalone that you can't beat. Uh, but we should see something starting to build up. So this is a very, very exciting period. We should look at the data. We hope to be reaching an increased significance. We should be com coming close to five sigma. We should see something building up in the four lepton. We have to see something building up. But in that channel alone, we'll need all the data of 2012 to conclude on the four lepton. This is where we stand. Very, very exciting period. So where do we go from there? Well, the situation is actually very interesting because in this mass range, here is a 120. Again, there's a little band on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the slide, but you don't see it here. If you draw a band from 115 to 125, what you see is that essentially crosses the point where for a fermiophobic theory, here I just disconnect the eggs from the fermion. I don't have to be so brutal. In principle, the eggs could disconnect only from the top. It could be topphobic. Or it could be chromophobic. The only thing you have to do is to make sure that the given charge of the fermion, they are coupling to different doublets, and you may extend the theory with some kind of effective X doublet model. So we, here we have the extreme case of a fermiophobic X, and these guys are gone. The, the main production is gone, and you're left with the vector boson fusion and the associated production. And the interesting thing is that the cross-section for a standard model in each of these ZZ, w, w, they basically cross over exactly in that mass range. Well, the thing is, they don't exactly cross over. For gamma gamma, well, it's very, very close. This is essentially at 1, 2, 5. If you go to ZZ at 125, well, you lose a factor of 2, roughly. And that's a big thing, because if you lose that factor 2 on the ZZ, and if they exit fermiophobic, you won't see the ZZ this year. You'll see the gamma gamma, and you have to work harder to see the ZZ, maybe double the limit again. So this is a very exciting uh, observation here. We made a fermiophobic analysis. This is driven essentially by gamma gamma, and this is what we find. This is the limit, 95% confidence level for fermiophobic eggs as a function of mass. Oh, as you see, well, this guy survives. At least it's not excluded at the moment, that particular point, which happens to be around 125. So the thing is open, the floor is open, and we should know very, very soon. Okay, well, this is just to point this one again. Okay, before I show you some uh, other uh, more recent result, let me just remind you some of the beauties of the, of the, of the work that has to go in the measurement of the gamma-gamma uh, uh, channel, which is very, very important in CMS. Here I just flash some of the issue. There is a very good talk, ex uh, comprehensive talk, done by our um, ECAL uh, 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 project leader that was made in very recently in Calor 2012. This is the relative response to laser light of our crystals. As you know, the crystal, they get yellow, and the, the light transmission is affected. This is affected more in the NCAP region, so that is at large eta, less in the central region, where crystals have been qualified for less than 6% loss over this amount of radiation. There is damage in recovery during LHC cycle, and we follow this with laser light. The correction from that is applied to data in less than 24, 48 hours. And we need a few iteration with data uh, reprocessing. And there were a few uh, iteration needed for 2011 data. Once we have these factors, well, we can apply that to check the stability of the response of electrons, let's say to W E nu. This is a check of the stability of the response to W E nu. Uh, using data from 2011. What you see essentially here is that once you have corrected the response, your uh, response relative E over P uh, is essentially one. In the barrel, this is true uh, within a few percent. 
and, and uh, in the end cap, this is true within about 10%. Uh, we actually, uh, 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 so we use this, these, 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 uh, these numbers here, we further correct the data. Then we, use the we look at the stability of the energy resolution for ZEE, again using data. And again, here what you see is essentially that the ECAL resolution from the peak is basically uh, is the stability before and after. You see that in the barrel, the resolution is essentially stable within errors. And in the end cap, there's a degradation by about 1%, which affects in, uh, 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 the, the resolution in the end cap. 1% in quality. So on top of this, we have further tuning of the correction for pileup effect, these are small effect, these are residual effect, these are shown here. So this is depend the dependence on the RICO on the number of vertex in the barrel in the end cap. We compare data with Monte Carlo with the default reconstruction and we apply Monte Carlo driven correction to the energy based on multivariate analysis of the energy response, including pileup. So there's a small residual correction here what happens then is the following. At EPS 2011, this is where we were at Morion 2012. Same situation, all categories, improvement, very important improvement of the effective uh, resolution for we have max. And uh, this is by the improved single crystal cluster corrections that goes on the, uh, uh, the, what I showed in the previous slide. And uh, this is where we are for each of coming soon. Not yet released. So looking at all that, we can now look at the data. This is what we have for 2011-2012 data in the low mass range. Well, it's essentially, unfortunately, blinded. CMS is blinded. CMS is completely blinded. I don't know the answer. No one knows the answer in the collaboration. We have updated all the analysis. We have not looked at data. We will open the box soon and see where we stand. The analysis has been improved in all the channels. OK, a few words to finish on supersymmetry. We have here also published a very large number of papers. Very quickly, we look at supersymmetry, for instance, in constraint models. Similar plot was shown by various speakers. We have limits above a TEV for squarks and gluino. Of course, SUSY is not dead yet. For instance, we might very well find the eggs and that eggs in the reasonably low mass range is sort of tailor-made for SUSY, a bit high, but still is okay for supersymmetry. Of course, there are also more complicated and may, some may think more natural SUSY model, and there are plenty of such models. The minimal model for sure is under pressure. So the experiment is now exploring more general mass spectra, simplified model we call them, or exceptional event topology, for instance, with multi-leptons, monophotons, etc. So this is just a reminder of something which was shown actually in the in the talk by uh, uh, in March already of one example of a simplified model. Here is a search for BSM event with Z to leptons, a jet, and missing energy. This is the typical topology that may give rise to such the uh, diagram that may give rise to such topology, where we have in the final state the Z and neutralinos here for the missing energy. The Z goes into neutrinos. So this is a multi-quark missing energy, uh, and you can have one of the two Z that goes in the lepton. This is what we measure. This is compared to Monte Carlo expectation and a particular point in the SUSY parameter space. Actually, this now has been really extended, and we have a very recent publication where we do a complete, a full comprehensive uh, 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 search for simplified model. This is the model I just mentioned here. This is the one. This is that one here. And we also have other channels. For instance, this one is one of the most uh, uh, powerful for uh, some models. This is where the gluinos decay in a bunch of top quark, and then we have missing energies from the uh, LSP. In all of these plots here, what you see is actually the assumption of a massless neutralino and the assumption that the mother and the neutralino mass differ by 200 GV. And of course, then you reduce quite significantly the sensitivity uh, on these uh, various models. OK. I mentioned search for anomalous event. These are very, very interesting searches. This is one that is done in multi-lepton final states. And actually, this is three or four uh, lepton with uh, additional uh, 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 missing, uh, missing energy. 
And uh, these, uh, these uh, search, they are, they are interesting also because in a way they complement what we are now doing in the X sector where we also have events with multi-leptons. After all, four leptons can also, could, could also come accompanied with missing energy. For instance, if you have a production of the X with decays in higher mass eigenstates of a neutralino, then they cascade down, you have two LSPs and multi-leptons. You could have four leptons and missing energy. That's a possibility. That's something that is very interesting to look at. So this was looked at in CMS. We do that in a, so let's say, general uh, case, generic analysis, and then we convert into constraint on CMSSM with neutralino or gravitino SSP, SUSY with aparity violating couplings, or GMSB in so-called slept on co lsp uh, scenario. And this is interesting because, at least, only it's a small excess, of course, it's interesting at least to follow. This is in the channels where we have at least one tau in the hadronic uh, decay mode or two tau in the hadronic decay mode, where we see this sort of small uh, excess of events, so we're not able to constrain as much as we would expect in that channel. So anomalous events are something to look at. They cover a very small amount of phase space, but they're very exciting topologies. Exotica. Again here. We have, it's probably the, the place where we produce most of our uh, publication. We have a huge number of publication already exploiting all of the 2011 data. I will su skip the search for dark matter. I leave the slide in so you can look at it. This was presented in the previous LHCC. Let me, uh, if I can manage to switch the slide, yeah. Let me move directly to the Z prime boson. Well, you've seen at the beginning of the talk the fantastic precision measurement we have on the Drelian. It's a very natural and clever thing to do to look for the next resonance. So we look for the Z prime, a heavy Z prime that decays into lepton, or a heavy Z prime that decays in a, a top a pair of top. That can be very massive. It's, if it's very massive, the jet will coalesce, and then we're looking for heavily boosted top with very special uh, reconstruction techniques. This is the most powerful to look for a very heavy Z prime. And here you show an example for top color Z prime. These are theories where the electroweak symmetry breaking results from some top condensate. And here the mass range is excluded from 1 to 1.6 TeV. That's well above Tevatron for a specific here assumption of the, of the, of the width of the Z prime. On the, on the uh, Z prime into lepton, this is where we stand. Uh, at the moment with limits well above or close to 2 TeV in the standard set of channels. These are most stringent constraints to date. We also search for heavy quark. Well, that's a very interesting set, a thing to look at, and it's also interesting because it's actually from standard model X point of view, if it's heavy quark and if it's coupled like the other quarks, it's basically excluded already in 120 to 600 GeV, and now we're direct search, we're coming very close to this range and we'll extend. This is a search for B prime going to TW, T prime going to WB, and with B mass, we ex ex essentially compare here again data and, uh, and observation in this channel here, and we see that we don't have an excess. We set a limit at 611 GeV for B prime and 557 for the T prime. And uh, okay, so clearly here, this is interesting, but we will have to consider heavy quark in the context of new physics with additional new decays. Okay, I just want to finish now on heavy ion. We have a very rich program of heavy ion physics in CMS. We have 15 published papers and a wealth of remarkable results. From the previous LHCC, I remind you this uh, suppression that was, this is observed for the production of uh, hadrons as a function of, of, of uh, PT. Um, uh, and this is observed here. You have on the right plot here what happens for the photon. Basically, for the photon, we don't see uh, this, uh, this suppression uh, as a function of PT. And actually, we can use that. And that has now been done using the full 2011 data. What you do is you use the photon, and then you use the photon to measure the balance with the jet, and then you measure the jet actually quenching from the photon using the photon as a tag. That's a very nice result that has been obtained. And here you show the, the ratio of the PT of the jet to the PT of the photon, the, ra the fraction of isolated photon that have an associated jet passing the analysis selection as a function of the number of participants. And that's what you see essentially is that the jets are suppressed and the average suppress is about 73%. And uh, for the moment, at least within error is about stable. And uh, the fraction of photon that are reconstructed is down to about 50% only. 
That's very, very uh, interesting result on jet quenching using some kind of independent uh, tag. The last result, and then I conclude on quark suppression. We have updated our result on the, on the epsilon uh, suppressed, uh, suppression. This is a new result. With the, uh, this is the PP data. This is a new result with the full 2011 data that was uh, published in the ARP probe, or shown in the ARP probe conference last week. So you see a very, very clear and strong suppression of these, uh, of these states here. And here we publish some kind of flagship plot as a function of the, uh, the, uh, the RAA uh, ratio of lead to, uh, to, uh, to proton proton, which should be one if there's nothing happening. And this is as a function of number of participants. And you see here with the epsilon, this is the old result on JPSI showed on top of it as it is uh, uh, going and as it is suppressed as a function of the number of uh, participants. So this is very, very nice and new results on the quark cornea suppression, which are a measure somehow of the temperature of the what we call a quark gluon plasma produced in these, uh, these collisions, or what we believe is most likely a quark gluon plasma. So let me conclude. The CMX experiment is operating at full regime. It's a very high efficiency uh, to collect large amount of data at 8 PeV. We have more than twice the luminosity of 2011 already collected. The discovery or exclusion of sun model X is in sight, yeah. very clearly. The analysis have been improved and redeployed under a strict blinding policy in CMS. We are going to open the bus very soon. I told you what happens at five inverse femtobarn, barn, additional to the previous five. Situation should start to clarify. We also have high precision measurement of standard model candles that have been performed. We have stringent constraints on BSM model that have been established. And the uh, BSM physics, well, remains out of reach for the moment. And clearly the better hopes are for the 13 or 14, who knows, um, uh, PEV. And really to conclude the conclusion, I'd like to thank the LHC accelerator team and the many, many other institutes and people that have made this fantastic adventure possible. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Yves, for this uh, nice presentation and overview. Questions? Yes, Andre. Uh, yeah, I have a question regarding the um, radiation damage to the crystals. So you, you, you showed the last year data. W what are your expectations for, the, for this year? How much light will you lose by the end of the run in the crystals? Do I have a projection for this year? Yeah. I don't have that projection for this year. But the situation is not so, I mean, we have basically uh, improved the monitoring uh, and, 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 and the feed, feedback loop. We have all the tools in place. The amount of pileup is larger, but not so considerably larger. Uh, we believe that what we have gained in knowledge for the last year's data will be applicable to the, this year's data, and we'll do, we'll do better. For, for the most forward uh, crystals, you lost about 40% of the light. Uh, so what, what will happen when you will get three times more luminosity this year? Well, we lose uh, light and we recover that. This is not a permanent damage. It's a damage to the... The, it's a collection centers, uh, yellow spots that are created in the crystal which evaporates. And there's a, there's a loss as a function of time. I don't know, maybe Tiziano can give a number on the part which is not recovered as a function of time. Well, you could, you could guess it from, from, that, from that plot. I mean, basically, the, uh, the most uh, uh, damaged crystals had almost all recovered by during the shutdown, so they basically are going to go well, through a similar cycle. You have to uh, you have to see that those are really the this is a, the, well, the worst mm -hmm. the worst possible. Uh, these these were extreme cases for crystals. It's not uh, it's not necessarily typical crystal mm -hmm. um, behavior. But it, it's clear that uh, the, the the highest the highest rapidity crystals are. Uh, are being affected more, and uh, but still, I mean, the amount of light which we get out of this crystal is still sufficient. For, in fact, we we estimate that it will be it will become possibly critical. Uh, we have done a recent study, in fact, on this. It will become possibly critical once you start exceeding the 300 
to four hundred investment to buy. At that moment, you must start wondering whether the performance of the extreme ETA crystals is still mm. acceptable. That's quite far in the future. Well, okay. Other question? Well, yes, please. In fact, it was in the same subject because uh, since we have only now only two technical stops until mm. the end of the year, so it's more a question that we took technical stops, you recover, but you continue degrading. So I imagine that with three times more inverse, uh, uh, with 15 inverse frontal bar until the end of the year, this course will go, continue going down with, with some recovery during the, the machine development, of course. But I mean, so I suppose you end up the end of the year uh, where in the most extreme well, region well, you sure. almost the, the, the point I want to point out is that this plot is taken for uh, a specific, from, a specific, from a specific purpose, which was to show at Calor 2012 what the worst possible crystal would do. We have 75,000 crystals, so it's not a typical... So this is not, mm. the, it's not, it's not, it's not the typical, the uh, the typical mm. crystal you have uh, in, in, in this region. And it is also, if you like, the extreme ring at 2.7... Okay, let's it should be said as well that basically one thing which you might wonder is uh, what is this, the effect of things on trigger. Now, it should be said that now we are deploying... Uh, we re-inject uh, these, uh, these the calibration is, factors is, is, in the trigger. So actually... It, it's injected yeah. uh, at the trigger level in the, in the lookup tables and uh, we even the first have, level and second level. We even have at the moment uh, on, the, on the level one... Uh, uh, trigger for electron uh, edge, which is uh, sharper actually than it was in 2011, thanks to the understanding of all the indication and the calibration factor, which has been fed back in the trigger. So actually, we are doing better at that moment. Okay, let's trigger. let's move on to other topics. Philippe, thank no, you. No, it's the same topic. Okay. I feel a bit responsible about it. Uh, um, yeah, I think you have to realize that this, the, 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 the damage is saturating, actually, is dose rate dependent. So, in fact, if you, if you would keep, for example, dose rate constant, even if we integrate uh, 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 tens of femtobarns, I mean, these curves will completely flatten. So I think we, we, when we irradiated the crystal, I mean, to test them, even we sent much, much higher doses, and we didn't lose much more than, uh, than 40, 50 percent. So this is, uh, you see it actually on, the, on these curves that it, it starts Plattin, to saturate. Plattin out, so yeah. I think the, 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 the thing which uh, uh, Tiziano mentioned is another type of damage uh, linked to uh, adronic uh, actually interactions. And this we will not see in the crystals before many, many, many years. Mm. So it's really for the high luminosity LHG that there is a question. Okay. So you should Let, not extrapolate this to zero. Let's take that as the final comment for the, <laughs> for the crystals. And you had... Uh, uh, just, uh, just a comment from a theorist. Um, as you, I'm sure, as you, as you know, uh, when the new results on the Higgs would be presented, uh, the theory community would be mostly interested in seeing the Higgs couplings, and if the, if the Higgs couplings uh, come out to be standard model like or not. Uh, now, you seem to focus on this uh, fermiophobic case, which is just... Uh, one special point in this parameter space, and it's not particularly theoretically motivated nor radiatively stable and so on. So all I want to say is that I hope that uh, to, just to concentrate on this case, you don't neglect the real interesting well, analysis. This is, this of, is of course, not at all the case. I wanted here to illustrate the fact that it's an interesting situation now that we might very well come close to having an answer in the reasonably near future, but the situation will be already more difficult if only to get the confirmation in the four letter. That will take more time, and it will take even more time to get something in the vector boson fusion where you get probably that through the eggs going in the tau pair, and that's a bit even more difficult. We don't have such a good resolution there. It's a difficult channel, and uh, this channel will of, of course be a very important one because here you, you're probing the, the WWH coupling, the direct consequence of the electroweak symmetry breaking, of the spontaneous electroweak symmetry breaking. All these are open ends at the moment. We still have to find something to start with. And these various different possible scenarios have to be investigated then. But it will take some time. We have to be really patient there. Yes, Titian. In fact, if I can add, I mean, of the three to 400 hertz of data which we park, a good fraction of those are uh, parked, uh, having in mind uh, 
these more detailed studies uh, for the future. I mean, one of the examples of the, is the egg star tau VBF. That's a difficult one. You only have one lepton, and you have adronic tau, and then you have jets in the forward region. This is difficult. So you have to bring that lepton threshold down, but you can't uh, cope with the trigger rate. So we're trying to get that out and try to recover that a posterior. I may have one more question since you have the leptons already mentioned. The multi-lepton search that was based on the 2011 data, right? The, the what you showed there. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I would be destroyed okay. if I show any result of the 2012. No, this was all 2011, yes? Okay. And it's, we're blind. I, actually, I don't know the answer. So okay. we'll, we'll know in the Zoom, soon, in the future. Okay, so let's uh, stop the, this discussion here now. Thank you for, for the presentation.